we're going to jump into one of my favorite things, topics on a Friday call, and that's the practitioner spotlight. We love to have FDNs on that have been doing this for usually a number of years, having success with it, and want to share their story, their personal health story, and just encourage you guys to either continue through the course to get to the point where you can do what they're doing um, and show that you can be successful. And also just share some tips, right, business tips, marketing, what things have worked for them. And as you notice, the theme throughout this is that it's different for every person. You kind of put your own spin on FDN. Keep the foundations and the, and the principles, those basic things, those need to stay there. But your own personality, the way you structure things, the way you get new clients, um, the way you put your packages together, some of those things are, are going to vary from person to person. So I like to hear the variety in the ways people are doing it. And maybe you can find something that matches more your personality, what you want to do. So hope these are just encouraging and a resource to you guys. Um, every time we do this, about once a month we do these. So uh, this week we've got on with us Rika Keck. And Rika is a graduate from I think 2013 is what I looked at, 2013. And you've heard her on this call uh, several times. She's, she'll call in and just wow us with something very insightful or kind of something we weren't thinking about, an aspect of a topic. So always good to have uh, her contributions. But we're going to get to, down into a good in-depth interview on her story and what she's doing now and uh, looking forward to it. So Rika, are you there? Hi, yes, I'm here, and again, thank you very much for having me on the show, and thank you to all the listeners out there. And it's really cool to be on the show with FDN because, as you said, sometimes I call in, usually in the summer when the schedule's a little lighter, and I still even myself have to go back to a couple of calls, and I'm looking forward to checking into the uh, food lists that we can send to clients because the more information we have at hand, the more it helps us as practitioners and saves us time, but also the more it helps our clients with compliance. So it's a two-way street. So thank you very much for getting that done. Oh, yeah, happy to do it. So that's that's what it's about, resources and support Mm -hmm. and making this thing happen just like you've done. So Mm -hmm. I usually ask about, first question is kind of what brought you to FDM, but there are a few things in your bio I wanted to ask you about that's not maybe typical, but you are not, you weren't born in the United States. Is that right? That's right. I was born in Johannesburg, South Africa. Yeah. My parents left Germany and moved to South Africa because my dad had work. And then I was born there and my two sisters. And I grew up in a German-speaking household, went to a German school, and but stayed in South Africa until I was about 23 years old. Yeah. And then also, too, I saw uh, your professional ballet dancer, and also worked six years on cruise ships. Now, were you working as a ballet dancer on cruise ships, or are these two separate <laughs> uh, sections in life, points in life? <laughs> I've had so many different sections in my life, and I'm recreating a new one as we speak. But I was a professional ballet dancer in the company in South Africa, doing the Swan Lake and their Sleeping Beauties and all that stuff. I was on a corps de ballet, and then when I retired there, I was going to go to England and study jazz dancing at Pineapple Dance Studios, but then I had a very bad car accident, and then I was supposed to go to university because I couldn't move, but I rehabbed myself, and I went to London, studied jazz, and thought, I'm going to travel the world, and then I ended up getting a gig on a cruise ship, and then I moved up to, in a way, a really awesome cruise ship, and then I stayed on it for about six years on and off dancing on a cruise ship, but then also going into fitness on a cruise ship. So so on a small ship, I would do fitness during the day, and then at nighttime, I would dance in the production shows. And that then led me into my fitness career once I came to the United States. Okay. So extremely active lifestyle, it seemed like there. So I guess kind of with athletics and, and, and dance and all the physical activity there, was health something that you were kind of into already and kind of grew up with, with grow up, or did you have a situation where you, your health just plummeted and it crashed and you had to kind of rebuild? What does your health story sound like? Well, I used to be a sugarholic, and when I was a professional dancer, I determined every Thursday was a chocolate day, and I would only eat chocolate all day. I mean, I have done everything. Sugarholic, I have done eating sweeteners, no-fat diet. I have done everything. And my car accident was a big wake-up, but that didn't put me on a nutritional path. It took me more on a life path, 
when I really had to reevaluate my life and realize that I was actually here to do something on this planet. But then it was on cruise ships. I mean, because you're a dancer, your party is central. I mean, I partied my butt off. But I always say the payback is here now. And one of the things that I, I am upset about is that when I applied for a green card here, I needed for the health certificate, I needed vaccinations. And I roughly had five or six vaccinations or something like that on one day. Because I clearly recall, and this is before I knew everything that I do today, I clearly recall saying, pump them all into one arm so I have one good arm. And I do feel that that has played a role in my later health problems that I have had and I'm working with. But one ongoing thing along the pathway is always that because I am a complete A-type personality, high stress, high performance, that I noticed as I got more involved in Paul Check's work and then also in FDN work, how digestive function on my side wasn't great or the high degree of oxidation that is happening or increased inflammation because of my nutrition and lifestyle. Because before I knew what I know today, I would have horrible migraines, and a lot of them, maybe like four or five a month. It got to the point where I didn't want to do weight training because I would spark off a migraine. It was, it was that bad. And I didn't want to live for Imatrex because I could only get nine pills a month. And I realized there was a serious problem. Yet when I came here to the United States, I didn't have a lot of money. So I would be on a budget, and part of my budget would be to have a hot dog and a yoo and a donut from the food truck and a Starburst. I mean, I have been on the junk food, so I know what it's like, and I know what it's like to build yourself up and learn, make changes, decrease the headaches, have better menstrual cycles, but at the same time being fully aware that working on health is an ongoing path. And to this day, I mean, just when I was at a conference in San Diego two weeks ago at the American Academy of Environmental Medicine conference, I learned something more about mitochondrial dysfunction that I have now integrated into my program this week about migraines. So everything that I'm learning, in a way I'm learning because of my own health path, get separately with my husband's Lyme disease situation over the summer, that forced me to step into all the work that I had studied before in bringing on Lyme treatment for his acute Lyme infections. So it is strange because when my sister had a breast cancer situation, I was there. I went, I flew to South Africa, but there's, you know, dealing with that and supporting her through that. And then Two years ago when my mother was very, very ill, acutely ill, and me going to the emergency room because I got a call here in New York City saying, mom's on life support, and I flew home to South Africa, and it was horrendous because there was in the emergency room, and they're all, there's this big tower, just pharmaceuticals, and I'm just thinking, oh, my God, how is she going to make it through this? And I just keep hearing Dr. Roundtree saying mitochondrial dysfunction, inflammatory cytokine storm, and I'm just hearing all the sepsis, and I'm thinking of LPS, and I'm just seeing all of this and witnessing firsthand emergency medicine at work, yet from our functional perspective, being fully aware of the implications that would happen with such interventions. So all along, I mean, I feel that in my life I have been tested with everything I have been learning. And because I always reach certain goalposts, but then I also realize that sometimes I don't know something that makes me more curious to learn more. And the more I learn, the less I know, and the more that actually motivates me to learn more. Because what I see here in New York City, where we are very limited with testing and lab testing, it is, it is not an easy environment to practice in. And this is where, when I went to Dr. Alex Vasquez, uh, probably three years ago in Portland, it was a mitochondrial dysfunction conference. He, he then said, on front of the stage, he said, people, listen here. You have to take a very detailed medical history. 
You have to listen to your patient. Not everybody can afford the testing. Then listen well and you do empirical treatment. And because I knew of challenges in New York that I was facing with lab testing, because I had one client declining testing because she did not feel comfortable doing it when I explained it, what we're doing here in New York, I realized I'm hitting a couple of roadblocks in implementing lab testing, so I need to up my game in a different way. And this is one thing that I have done a lot, and especially with the field of Lyme disease and co-infections, because testing can be so inconclusive, and yet there is so much going on with the individual. So to me, it's one has to become a better listener, an investigator, reading between the lines, looking at family history, looking at emotional traumas, just going back even into the parents' history for emotional traumas if they had to escape their home country, for instance, uh, fleeing from Hungary to the United States. All of these things can come into effect on an emotional level. They can come into effect on methylation levels. And this is where Dietrich Klinghardt's work with family constellations. He's the first one who, uh, that perked my interest when he said, for instance, speaking about the Holocaust, how the first born in a family will carry the burden of, for instance, those individuals who were fleeing the Holocaust. So that emotional DNA is transferred, and now we know it goes through four generations. And it's just learning from all different people in a big spectrum from a mind-body perspective, nutritional level, I mean, even exercise poll check level, right? It all comes together. And ultimately, I always believe that everything I do, I have to experience myself first. I do all testing on myself first. And this is what brought me to FDN because I was very interested in testing functional testing, and I'm very grateful for the medical director program. I know that some some people might complain that it's, it's more money, but I'm saying this gives us access to do any lab test that we feel is prudent to do for our client with support from the lab. I mean, that is unbelievable because this is, allows us to elevate our practice to such a level that, uh, frankly, from what I see in New York City, you know, regular conventional medicine leaves it big time in the dust. And for our clients who come to us, they often, I mean, we're never the first stop. Uh, we're not the second stop or third or fourth one. By the time they come and see us, there are often multiple layers that need to be addressed. And they've gone through the regular gastro or the regular endocrinologist, or they have gone to functional medicine doctors. We have to up our game, and this is why being in FDN is vital because it gives us access to lab testing if we think it is the right thing to do, the advanced testing, besides the, the tests that are in FDN in the program. And at the same time, it, it gives us a community that we can ask questions in without feeling, you know, weird or stupid, like this is a stupid question. We can ask questions. We can learn more. We can get uh, professional support. We can get community support. So ultimately, we become a better practitioner and we can serve our clients better. And Dr. Stuart White from Standard Process, he always said to me, when you work with a client, you have to be remarkable. He says, by that I mean that your client must remark to someone else the experience they had with you. And that is what I try to do in my practice. So my practice is a lot through word of mouth. It's growing, and I want it to grow more and more. But at the same time, you know, cases are so complicated, and it takes time. Mm -hmm. Sorry for the long-winded answer, but I cover a lot of different bases in there. (laughs) Sorry. You do. Yeah. That's fine. That's fine. It's good. I was going to say that's, that's several points you made there. One that I'm picking up on is that it's about you know whose test results are we looking at. You know, there's some things you can't test for. <laughs> there's no test, but so you have to be a good clinician and you have to observe and ask lots of questions and get into that. So everything's not everything is apparent. And even too, you can have a lab result there, but then what you're hearing from the person may be different. So. 
what do you do? You have to kind of combine these two things, and you end up making your call as a practitioner. So that's a big point for everybody to keep in mind, especially people that are just, just getting into this. Yes, the labs are great. It's, it's objective information we did not have before, but you always have to couple it with who is this person, how are they presenting, what's their history, and then also the stressors you're talking about, and mental, emotional stressors, spiritual stressors, all these different things come together, and it's, also, it's kind of our job to start to unravel these things in a systematic way. Don't get overwhelmed by all these um, different labs that you can run and different things where uh, people talk about, like maybe on the Facebook forum, um, you hear lots of different new things. There's a systematic way to go through that. So just kind of take one thing at a time. And, you know, obviously the body can't change a million things at once. So kind of work through it very systematically. But and the second thing you said, I think, was uh, community and support. That's exactly why we do this call, while we have the um, association for FTM professionals we just, we just launched. We have the Facebook page, uh, medical director program. They'll support their support out there. If you want to do this work, then you can do it. And we're not going to hold you back. We're going to help you. So that's that's the whole goal. We want people to be successful and be out there doing that. So um, great points there. Um, you can tell with the experience, like you mentioned, also in New York, you've got a little uh, a little less access. There are certain labs you they won't let you run because of mm-hmm. well, we can get into that later. But labs that you can't run, so you really have to rely sometimes upon your clinical skills um, rather than the labs sometimes, and you still get good results doing that. Yeah, I mean, for me, if someone wants to work with me. I mean, I have the questionnaires. Of course, I want to see what they eat because, I mean, here in New York, the people who come and see me, they're already eat, eating organic. They're eating free range. You know, they. I always find that clients come, they have done their homework, and my competition is Dr. Google, the guy at the health store, and my best friend. So those are the three that are before they even talk to me. Then they tell me, oh, I have a great diet, and I look at it. It might be organic. It might be juice press. It might be all this. But, I mean, with SIBO that is going on, fungal infections that is happening, the timing of how people eat, blood sugar balance, that is often where I find where problems start right off the bat. They might be eating healthy foods, but when are they eating and in what combination are they eating? That is really important with what I see in New York. At the same time, when I'm working with Lyme disease, this is why the food list from Dr. Pomeroy is very helpful. Yet, and this is something that I see on the Facebook group, is, yeah, there are so many different SIBO food plans, and they do vary from here to there, and some people can tolerate certain foods on the SIBO food plan, and others cannot. It is so individual. And then when we throw in the oxalate factor or in the salicylate factor on top of that, it gets complicated, but ultimately, let's first see what you're eating and when you're eating and start with that. And it doesn't matter what I'm working with in my practice. I want to see the food diary, lifestyle diary, when you're sleeping, what, you know, what are you drinking? Are you moving? Are you not moving? In New York City, a lot of times I have clients who come to me, I'm like, man, you are way over-exercising. You are blowing your body out. And I'm saying, I I don't care if you enjoy doing Barry's boot camp, but I mean, your adrenals are shot, your gut is shot, you're not sleeping. It's like in New York City, everything needs to be fast and power, 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 and more is better. And that mindset to give the individual permission to take it easy and to be okay with not driving yourself so hard and instead plugging in a 10-minute chakra meditation on YouTube, which is one of my favorites, you know, I always try to explain that I know because I used to be a type, I still am, but how I had to adjust my lifestyle, how I had to learn to manage myself better, but how most importantly I had to be mentally okay with it. Because people say, Oh, I'm not gonna exercise, I'm gonna gain weight. I'm like, you keep doing what you're doing. Number one, you will gain weight and number two, your chance of having a baby are pretty much becoming more and more zero. Right. I don't say it that way, but fertility issues are rampant, you know. And right. essential fatty acids are also very much things that are looked for because a lot of times people might be eating healthy fats, but it's just olive oil. You know, they need the healthy omega-6s or they taking so much uh, omega-3s, fish oil, you know, and, but their, their inflammation oxidation levels are so high that it's actually more oxidizing inside the body instead of 
help in quality inflammation. I mean, it is case by case. But no matter whom I work with, the food diary is very, very important. And with that, then, I always, besides the medical history that I mentioned before, I also like to see about 13 markers on a blood test. When I give my client the list, I say, go to your physician. You know, I say, first check that it's covered by insurance. If something is not covered by insurance, don't do the test. Otherwise, you'll end up with a bill, a couple of thousand dollars that I don't want. What has happened to me quite a few times in New York City is, number one, if I want to see a thyroid panel, I might get back TSH or TSH and a free T4. I never, sometimes I, I don't get antibodies for the thyroid, and it blows my mind, but I don't. And sometimes I like to use the antibody test as an indirect also, you know, gut marker and Lyme marker. Yeah, but then MTHFR. You won't believe how many individuals have come back to me and their doctors don't know about the MTHFR. And I'm not saying that this is the most important marker. It isn't. There are other markers I can find on a blood test to bring in correlation. Yet, to me, is with what we know in the MTHFR, it is a... It's another piece in a big puzzle that can be extremely helpful, especially when you look at the family history and with the symptomology that is being presented by the client. So this is very helpful. But in New York, I mean, yes, like you said, we cannot do the MRT, we cannot do Cyrex, we cannot do Genova Metametrics uh, on the Lyme test from Igenix. We are restricted to... Uh, just to very few panels on that that we can do in New York State, and it is limiting. So if someone wants to do testing, they can go across the bridge or to Connecticut. I'm going to do the OATS test, but I'm going to reroute it through Connecticut. But at the same time, where we have our home, there's no FedEx close by, and I'm only there on weekends. So it is a little bit more complicated, but if it comes to urine or saliva, I can work it through Connecticut. And even with clients, I can take the samples and send them off from FedEx in Connecticut. But when it requires a blood draw, it is much more difficult. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let me back up a little bit here. I was going to say, mm-hmm. just for timeline here, how did you come upon FDN? How did you, how'd you connect with us? Oh, golly. Um, Do you remember <laughs> a podcast or or uh, caught Reed somewhere speaking? Or No, I, I could read. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a Czech person. I have done Czech Level 2 Practitioner Fitness, Czech Level 3 Holistic Lifestyle Coach. That's also how I know the work of Dr. Daniel Kalish. Uh, I want to say Reed is somehow connected to Paul Czech. And that's how I listened to the FDN program. I thought, yeah, I want to do that. Because I'd also signed up for the uh, F. Functional Medicine University way back when, so that's also one of my resources. But I thought if I do FDN, I can do lab testing that I think is prudent because having had my own experiences with doctors in New York City, um, I, and I'll be very honest, I am a terrible patient. When I go to a doctor, I mean, right now my physician in New York City I don't see eye to eye with him, so I call up the office. I say, may I see the nurse practitioner? And I go to the nurse practitioner, and I tell her what blockers, blood markers I want to run, and I can give her a rationale why, and that's that's how things happen. I get this stuff back on a portal, and I evaluate my own blood labs. Right? Mm-hmm. This is what I do in New York City because I'm just too tired of dealing with things here because also, for instance, I had a, a client with a gastro problem. I put her through a great protocol she was under the care of a gastro at NYU, and then she came back to me. She said, the gastroenterologist wants to see my protocol because the gastro had just put on acid-blocking medication. So I took the time to write out my protocol, and I wrote out the rationale for the gastroenterologist at NYU. I'd hoped that maybe here I could create a bridge with a physician, I mean, everybody thinks very highly of these institutions in New York City, but I thought, let me open up a bridge, because I always like to have bridges to physicians, because we have to work together. But I sent it off to the gastroenterologist. I didn't hear a single word. And also with clients in the past, when I wanted to run certain checks through their doctors, 
I would write out why, and then I thought, you know, I think I'm stepping on their toes. So I've stopped doing that, you know. And I just give my client the markers, and I tell them, look, if it's covered by insurance, do it. If it isn't, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll figure it out another way. And this is how I've been doing it with the medical history, with the client's clinical findings, uh, you know, lifestyle, environmental screen questionnaires, adrenal questionnaire, and, of course, the uber-important food diary. Right. How many people do you see locally, like within New York State, in, versus how many people you see remotely? Because even though you are in New York, you could have a client in Delaware that can run some of these labs. So what's your breakdown of that? Are you mostly New York State folks or around the world? Well, I'm very happy when someone contacts me and they're not in New York State. Right. I mean, for instance, there's one case I'm working with. I was, it was referred to me by Dr. Horowitz from upstate New York, Lyme disease doctor, for, well, I bumped into his nurse practitioner at ILADS maybe three years ago. We were sitting next to each other at a lecture on methylation. Anyway, they sent me patients to do their nutrition work. It's a complicated situation because they are being treated for Lyme co-infections and all the other stuff by Dr. Horowitz's practice, but they come to me for diet. And what I have found is that usually the cases that I do see, the digestive tract is extremely compromised from the heavy antibody cocktails that are being used in Lyme treatment by this physician. Not every Lyme doctor does that, but the guts are putting it bluntly a mess. In that, detoxification pathways are a mess. So on a local level, liver gallbladder function, uh, enzyme function, hydrochloric acid function, be it motility, SIBO, you know, fungal infections, the digestive tract is not good. And then often they come and they've already maybe tried paleo or they've tried FODMAP or they've tried SED or they've tried GAPS. They've tried everything and it's not working. You know, so for instance, in this case that was sent to me by Dr. Horowitz, and I was very happy because I said, okay, let's do the GI map and let's do BioHealth. And we did both tests concurrently. This is about just two months ago. And because it's not New York State, it's no problem. You know, it's easy. So if I do see clients in New York, I mean, which I do, and then because often usually I'm more interested in getting more appropriate Lyme disease testing done in co-infections because often they haven't done it or they've only done a Western blood test. And the Lyme and co-infection testing is also very expensive. So, you know, I'd like to get more information on that. If I were, you know, I have some clients where there comes a certain degree of trust where if I had the FDN, I can say, look, this test here is not in a way... We can, we can send it out from New York State, but there's a little box here on the questionnaire, and I will fill out the box because in order for us to do this test here from New York, there are certain limitations, but what's going to do is I will cross out the test, and here's the test kit. It's going to give us you know, definitely more information that's going to help us figure out more what's, what's happening in your body so you can feel better. you know. But at the same time, I will say... Um, I will cross out that little box that's on a questionnaire, and I will tell my client, and I don't know where you take this test, you know. And that way I'm indirectly saying, you know, don't, I don't know where you're taking the test because it's not supposed to be taken in New York State. It's kind of a, a gray area. And the issue is not that... Um, that a client could blurb out to their doctor that they did the test, and it happened to a chiropractor who did a test, and the client didn't want to, in a way, say anything bad, but the client had, or the, the chiropractor's patient told another doctor that they had done this test, and it showed that they had such and such a condition, and then that physician said, what test are you talking about? And it came about that this test is not legal in New York State, and the whole thing unraveled pretty badly. This has been one of my concerns because I don't want to put myself at risk, and this is one of the reasons why I'm very happy with out-of-state clients, but it doesn't preclude that I'm not going to consider doing a FDN test with a client in New York City if I, if I feel a, a deep sense of trust. And I find that with 
the questionnaires we have with all the tools in the toolbox that I'm able to, and, and the blood screening, that I'm able to get information that is very helpful in helping my clients, even if then I choose not to do some of the tests that we do on FDN. Mm-hmm. Work with what you, what you have, the information that you have available, sure. Yeah. I mean, we, we can do GI map in New York, so so that's great. Right? Yep. So we can do yep. that. 401 is, is not, 401H, you know. And uh, when I spoke to the uh, Dutch testing lab, they said New York is fine. I saw there's a question on Facebook, so I have to double-check that, but that is acceptable here. Well, Biohealth 205 is not, you know. So there are more tests coming into FDN that we can do in New York State, but for instance, MRT, I can't do here. Cyrex autoimmune panels can't do here, which is sometimes I wish I could. Mm-hmm. Right, because I noticed that you've got, you know, I know you talk about Lyme, but do you see people with, like, autoimmune conditions also? Like, what what is your kind of typical client look like, or do you have a typical client that you deal with as far as certain symptoms or conditions they come to you with? I wish there was a typical client because there isn't one, you know. Each one is unique, and I'm sure everybody will agree with me on that one. Each one is unique in what they have done in trying to get better and in what they are able to do. Um, when in the word able, I include in what they are willing to give up, what they can afford, mm-hmm. and also what they are able to do with regards to compliance, because this is where the subconscious mind plays a very, very important role. At the same time, clients can be very... Everybody wants a quick fix, and I can understand that very well. If I have something bugging me in my body, I want to get rid of it quickly. I don't want to be in pain. I don't want this itch here. I don't want this gut thing here. We want to get rid of things quickly. I always say we live in a New York minute, but to become well is not a New York minute. right? And I'm very clear with all my clients that if they choose to work with me, that this is a process. And that with everything that is being presented in the first 90-minute intake consultation, that meeting with me once is not going to be able to change their world around. But to me, it's if I see one improvement in the next week, that means we are hitting on a target, and that to me is the motivational factor. Clients expect that when they come to see me, that all of a sudden they're going to get one pill and they're going to get better. It's not going to happen that way. First things first, they have to learn what foods not to eat, you know, let's work on nutrition, getting to bed earlier. Maybe drink some more water, you know. Cut an exercise class, maybe have a little bit more quiet time, you know. It's it's these foundational things that are the hardest to do. And I find that clients, not, not all, not all, and this is one of the reasons why I like, it sounds really horrible, I like working with clients who are really, have gone through a, quite some difficult times because they know, and especially I see this in the Lyme community, they know that everything takes time. They know that um, not everything works right away or, you know, that you have to change track on the path. There is a whole different mindset. But what I do find is also very important that individuals need to realize that, yes, if you have a B6 deficiency or, you know, methylfolate deficiency or hydrochloric acid deficiency going on, that if you're going to go and do meditation, it's not going to improve your, you know, your nutrient status at that time. You will still need B6 or, you know, B12 folate. You know, we need to look at what you're eating, you know. And if weight loss is always a big one, but one thing that I see with younger women, especially women in their 20s, and it's very alarming, is um, besides infertility, um, a lot of gut issues. And these women are in their 20s. And, for instance, I had a client who was sent to me she, for two years. She was always seeing the gastroenterologist, and it was just always a neural uh, of um, acid-blocking medication. Each time, he would just keep on acid-blocking meds, telling her, it's okay. She would say, is it all right to be on this long term? It's okay, for two years. She's 23. Right? And this is the stuff that I see, that women are in their 20s. You know, they they come to me or... As I say, a woman in their early 30s, and they can't conceive. I had one client come to me for two years. She couldn't conceive. 
She was desperate to have a baby with her husband. Once we started to unraveling, it turned out SIBO was going on. But also, even though I don't uh, take it as a main marker, I'd, in this case, I took into consideration type O because I saw a lot of allergies and food sensitivities, so the gut is a mess. But then with the SIBO on top, we pulled out the foods. Her compliance was wonderful. She felt such a great difference. And then also because of the hemorrhoids, suddenly we had bowel movements going on, change in that direction. Oh, my God, I had her attention. Then I said, awesome, now we're going to bring on some Interface Plus proteolytics. Yeah, skin broke out. I'm like, that is awesome. We are making contact. Brought in red root for lymphatic drainage, up the drainage, a little bit more gall, better liver support. She's doing great. Next thing, I'm about to embark on the botanical overgrowth protocol, I get a text saying she is pregnant. This was after eight weeks of working with me, after two years of not being able to have a baby. Right? Mm. Now, I didn't work on fertility. Yes, I brought an evening primrose oil because I know the omega-6s. You know, I brought some like cod liver oil on there, uh, endocrine support, HPA axis, but started just going into the gut. Food eliminations, telling her, get off the computer at 11 o'clock at night. You know, it's, it's affecting you. It's affecting your hormones. It's affecting your immune system. You know, just nutrition and lifestyle. And then also, when did the exercise? Because she was exercising and told her to back off a little. Next thing, she's pregnant. Right? No. Huh. So along the pregnancy, because I didn't, I had done a run the blood labs. And I saw that on the MTHFR, she had the A1289C. So I'm like, okay, she's had difficulty conceiving. They had checked the husband's sperm, sperm counts, everything fine. She had been one of the participants on a on an app for um, tracking of hormones. They were actually had planned a consultation for a fertility specialist in two weeks' time. I didn't know that. But once she was pregnant, I thought it took two weeks to get pregnant. We, of course, had to revise the supplement schedule mm-hmm. and make sure the bowels are moving, make sure, I mean, Megaspore Biotic has been a godsend in her situation, and she feels a difference. And then also we use, for instance, a Megaspore Biotic and coconut oil for suppositories with yeast infections. So there are different ways to support the immune system and, of course, healthy fats. We had to pull off the evening primrose oil because that's contraindicated early on in the pregnancy. So there's, but just using nutrition as the main driver to sustain the pregnancy. I never told her about the MTHFR issue and increased risk of miscarriages. That was on my radar. I did not bring it up to her. I just supported her through the pregnancy, even just when she emailed me right now saying she's worried about the flu season. She doesn't want to take the flu shot. Of course, they want to push the flu shot on you when you're pregnant. So she's totally awesome. right? So I give her a couple of blogs to look at, and this is how we work together. And she's going to give birth now December the 24th. And I never mentioned MTHFR to her because I thought, why should I even bring it up? She's going to be stressed about it then, and that can induce changes in the body. I'm amping up her stress. Meanwhile, she's already having enough trouble figuring out the stroller and baby situation. For me, it's more, you know, and genes are not destiny. You might have a gene, and it's totally not on, or it's it's not, you know, it's 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 dormant in a manner of speaking. So to me, it's more, who is this person? How can I help her? She's pregnant, fabulous, wonderful. Let's support the pregnancy, support her in it. I make sure her microbiome is good so she passes the uh, test that's coming up later on, make sure the vaginal floor is supported, that she can have a natural birth and give her baby the best, best entrance into the planet, you know. So this is where, to me, is okay. I didn't do any lab testing on her. I only had blood labs on her, right, and a food diary. So she she was 31, and she'd been having gastric issues since the age of 22, right, We've seen all the gastroenterologists and so on. And this is then where, for instance, with Lyme disease, yeah, you have to bring down the immune burden. There are always co-infections in play. There are mold issues in play. But at the same time, who is the person? 
and to me is if it seems all overwhelming, where do we begin foundational principles? Nutrition, right. lifestyle, hydration, sleep, right? Then endocrine axis, because to me the brain axis, I call it a tree trunk in the body. If we go into the brain, and I, I, I'm, I'm very honest, I'm, right now I'm totally infatuated with the brain. That's a big offshoot from Lyme. But a friend of mine was in a traumatic brain accident, uh, well, a car accident, and she has uh, she had a very bad concussion and a tremor. So now she is disabled because of a brain injury. So I'm being pulled into that area of brain function. But there's a cross uh, cross connection with Lyme disease if it affects the central nervous system. And if we're looking at the central nervous system, we're looking at the endocrine system and the immune system. So they're all interconnected. I call it the triangle, the endocrine system, nervous system, and the immune system, the triangle. And on top of that, I have the digestive system and detoxification system and, of course, the infections and environmental pollutants superimposed on that. So when I work as a practitioner, these are the key points that I really go into. And depending on what's being presented, depending on what the client has done, depending on what is bugging them right now the most, which to me is the entry point, while I work on the foundational stuff, uh, I always call it, it's, it's like a big puzzle piece. And sometimes it can be a real labyrinth, or I call it a kaleidoscope, because there's so many pieces that go on at the same time. And that's just that's how that's I work. Up. Especially with the with clientele, it sounds like you deal with with Lyme and autoimmune conditions. Those are some more complex situations. But do you, do you deal with people that just have you know basic digestive upset, fatigue, things like that? Do you get to see some cases? Not shouldn't maybe use the word easy, but more simple cases. Do you get your fair share of those too? You know, you, you can't imagine how often I say spirit. Why can't I just have an easy case of acid reflux? You know, same thing with well, exercise, actually. Gone. It was all, yeah. At the same time, I always believe that, you know, you, you're given the challenges of spirit things that, that you can you can make a difference. And sometimes I, you know, it makes me become a better practitioner because if I don't know something, I get frustrated with myself and I research. And I go and I go to at least, I try to go to four conferences a year to learn stuff. And it's not just about learning. It's it's the in-between stuff, talking to other doctors, other practitioners, learning from them, troubleshooting with them, you know. So there is never an easy case because I don't think there is. And my philosophy is if you are a tired person, your digestion is tired. Your hormones, your glands are tired. So how it manifests in your body is individual mm-hmm. and how you've been about suppressing the symptoms, you know, kind of had secondary tertiary implications. And at the same time, is a client might come, I mean, it's always classic, they come and see you because they want to lose weight. Right? Meanwhile, the weight is a symptom of a body that is just out of balance. My biggest thing is, you know, if they're on medications, because medications throw a wrench into the whole scenario. And especially when they are on SSRIs, you know, when they are on, a, if they're on acid blocking medications or stuff like that, that is, it's it's not easier, but it's it's more manageable. When when they are on drugs for cardiovascular function, or if they're on drugs for depression and mood enhancers, that is also because the gut is just so implicated. So it is a sign of our times because a lot of young women are on Lexapro, one of those anti-anxiety medications. Meanwhile, they might be having hormonal imbalances, which is why their neurotransmitters are off. But, you know, I always tell my clients, so I just, don't take your medication. You just kind of work around all those things? Yeah, you got to work around it. I was going to say, yeah, you have to work around it. You're going into yeah. that. How do you deal with that? What, when somebody says they're on uh, SSRI or Lexapro, whatever it happens to be, uh, yeah. what, what do you think? Do you just kind of do FDN, do it your way, or are there some other things that you do? Well, to me, is when people come to my meds, that's not my terrain, but it's very important for me to, number one, to have all the side effects of the meds they're on and present that to them because the meds can keep them stuck and create effects that are, you know, side effects that are going on right now and impede the pathways to healing. So to me, it's education is crucial 
because if you come to me for weight loss and you're on two SSRIs, you know, just look at it. Weight gain are common side effects of SSRIs. So if they are on SSRIs or anti-anxiety medications, it is a challenge. But to me, it's okay. Let's keep that in mind. But let's first get digestive function optimized. Let's work on nutritional lifestyle. You know, let's make you a healthier person and also address the endocrine balance that perhaps you can have a discussion with your physician or your doctor and start decreasing the dosage of your medication. Yet I have had a case where this individual was on three different anti-anxiety, well, like, like uppers and downs, it like, ah, oh, a whole cocktails of these meds. And when I said, look, ah, oh, yeah, and she wanted to lose weight. When I said, look, this is what I'm going to do. We're going to start with... Um, Phase one, starting with healthy eating, seeing where the difficulties are, and seeing how we can start to build up the body so it works better, you know, works better in our speak, meaning functions better, functional. And, you know, let's bring on some exercise, and let's, you know, take it step by step at at the level that you can do. Because in the past, I used to be extremely hardcore. But I've come to realize that in most cases, it is so important to meet my client where my client is at. Mm -hmm. If I put on expectations, and this is what I find that through training, we know, oh, this is what needs to be done, this is what needs to be done, this needs to be done, that, 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 you got to do all of this. It is completely too overwhelming for the individual. And to me, as I said, I don't like to put my client, unless there are extenuating circumstances, I don't like to put my client into a nutritional straitjacket. But when you're dealing with SIBO, or for instance, my client overseas in Romania, a 10-year-old child with Lyme viruses, the whole nine yards, when she eats raw apples, she gets nosebleeds. And my clue was that when she eats lettuce, it's completely undigested in the stool. Right away, I'm thinking salicylates. So she'd already been off dairy and gluten. So when I said to the mother, okay, let's go on to the moderate salicylates, keep the high ones out, and make sure everything is cooked, the nosebleed stopped. Right. That Plus I added in more lymphatic drainage. I'm big on lymphatic drainage. You know, this is the homeopathic studies because we always talk about detoxification, but what about all the junk that's floating around our cells that needs to be cleaned up? We need to drain, 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 drain. That's what I write about in my Lyme disease book. So nutrition, we can always make inroads with what our clients are eating and living like, how we decrease toxic exposures in their home, in their makeup, personal care products how we help them get better sleep and better quality sleep, you know, how we start to, once they feel better, say even digestive enzymes, and they don't feel so bloated or they have an easier bowel movement, once we get their trust and attention, that allows us then to make more inroads and then to get more into sometimes even discussing more of the emotional factors that are going on or discussing toxic relationships that are going on that are sabotaging them or keeping them stuck. Just because you know something they can be doing doesn't mean that you give it to them in the very beginning. You don't give them 20 things to do. No. They're coming to me for acid reflux or bloating. They're not coming to me to discuss a fourth chakra situation. Do you know what I mean? (laughs) So to me it's, yeah, this might be all be going on. I mean, when I, this one client on three SSRIs and the weight loss, I mean, one thought in my head was, had she been abused? Because sexual abuse is huge with weight loss, huge, and it's a huge sabotage. And once I started going into the work, and I mean, these are very intimate details, that it needs to be a complete trust and this is why the questionnaire is so important, because I was stunned in talking to my clients how often sexual abuse does come into it. It was shocking. Yeah. So if we or individuals carry these wounds and don't address them, right, or if there's been an alcoholic in the family, pyroli is a big factor, B6 deficiency, methylation factors, you know, those can already be indicators in a medical history that even if I don't remark upon it, 
I write it in my own notes. I always write my notes for me, and I write notes for a client. Because then before I meet the client again, I read through my notes. They give me the back <laughs> backdrop information versus the client who I don't want to overwhelm with all the stuff that I'm thinking about. Right, you know? right. Well, Rika, we've got about five minutes left, so I wanted yeah. to ask you two more questions, make sure we did cover these. The first one was kind of about marketing and getting new clients, but I also want to make sure that you can give everybody your website. And I think you mentioned a book that you have written or are working on, so I want to make sure you mm-hmm. get to talk about that. But let's let's talk about just briefly here. Um, how, how do you get new clients? A lot of people getting into this say, okay, how do you how do you do this? Um, are, you, are you out there speaking? Are you word of mouth, uh, social media? What what ways do you use to to pick up clients? My thing is referral, word of mouth. And also, actually, just yesterday, someone called me from Beyond Balance. They were sent to me through Beyond Balance, which is a supplement company for Lyme, through there. Then uh, my gynecologist uh, in New York City, if anybody's listening in New York City, I have an ace one who's on our planet. She referred a a client to me whom I'm going to get on the phone with tomorrow morning. So it's word of mouth, referrals, and networking. And, of course, the book that is coming out in November, that is going to be another one, but public speaking. And I want to become very much involved in the Lyme community. So I'm going to ILADS in Philadelphia in November. And just meeting more and more Lyme disease doctors, going to Lyme disease conferences, because then when they have patients, they know they can't do everything. They're doing the Lyme treatment. They don't have time to go into the digestion and nutrition so this is where, you know, networking and building bridges to physicians, seeding relationships and staying with relationships is very important. And it's taken me years, really years, to build this up in New York City and also around the country. So, for instance, now when I was at a conference in San Diego, I spoke to a doctor who specializes in addiction in New Paltz, whose son had a traumatic brain injury. And I found a functional neurologist in New York City whom I'm going to see for my own brain, but I told him about it and told him I'm going to let him know so he can figure it out for his son. You know, this is how we can start to make bridges. Online, social media, not so much. I mean, I've been so busy with work, studying and writing my book, or books, I should say, because I've actually written two, but only one is being published now in November, that um, it's been a lot. And at the same time, trying to take care of myself, and just putting myself out there. You know, it's only, I'm a one-man band, so I have to do the learning, the marketing, the working, and doing doing my own life, yeah. And it's, it's a challenge. What's your book title? Do you have a title set? Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe yeah. not, but what's your yeah. book title? The title is called Nourish, Heal, Thrive. And nice. this, it's called a comprehensive and holistic guide to living with Lyme disease. And I'm very empathetic that this is not a book about treating Lyme disease, but this book is an important adjunct to anyone who's living with Lyme disease or anybody who is in Lyme disease treatment, be it antibiotic treatment or be it botanical treatment. There's a lot of information on there about the whole labyrinth of Lyme, the whole backdrop, I mean, holistic dentistry, histamine factors, food sensitivities, digestive troubles, elimination factors, blood sugar balance. Initially, this book was inspired by the doctor sent to me by Dr. Horowitz, who had a messed up digestive tract. And I wanted to write a booklet that is 25,000 words, but then it became a big book. And for the past year, I've been busy writing it. It's being published by Greenleaf Book Group, and I've gone through multiple edits, and it, sh- it was supposed to be out October 23rd. Uh, I'm going to hear today or on Monday when the publishing date is out, so it's going to be sometime in November. So I'm excited well, that's about awesome. it. awesome. Yeah. We are, yeah. and we are too, so make sure you let us know when it's out there, and we'll uh, let everybody know. It sounds like a great, a great resource, and obviously just the time talking here with you, you've got just this wonderful balance and I think really – caring personality and with the information behind it to kind of live in both worlds. You understand what they're dealing with, with the, the conventional way you would treat Lyme, and then you look at the, the functional side, the natural side, and kind of bringing those together. So so that's tremendous, and the work you're doing is just, it sounds really exciting. 
um, I, I want to go ahead and give out two. You've got a couple web addresses here. So I'll tell you it's nyintegratedhealth.com. That's right. And then chronic. Lyme disease dot me as well. Yeah. So, if you got yeah. um, a client you guys are working with and the Lyme is uh, a bit over head, need a little help with something or some insight, Rico's I'm sure will be available to kind of help uh, steer you a little bit and help you out as part as, as part of this uh, family and community. So, yeah. all right. Well, we got just a couple seconds left here. So, um, Rico, May anything I one else thing? to conclude? Yeah. 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 One, yeah. Just one thing with Lyme, and this is what I see: um, functional medicine. Okay, we have conventional medicine, then we have functional medicine, and then we have environmental environmental medicine, and that to me is where the cool stuff is happening right now. Now, on top of that, somewhere around we have Lyme disease, and I see a lot of functional medicine doctors treating Lyme disease functional medicine only. You can't. You must bring an environmental medicine into that, and you must know Lyme disease, because just treating Lyme disease like from a functional medicine perspective without fully knowing Lyme disease, co-infections, and mold issues and the environmental aspects to it, functional medicine is not enough. And this is one thing that I see, and the emotional component comes into it as well. It's it's just one thing that I observe, and also looking at a Lyme treatment protocol from someone who went to um, Canyon Ranch, it was like a real functional medicine approach. I'm like, they're missing the boat. There's no drainage here. You know, it, it, one, one needs to understand Lyme co-infections, changing forms, flares, Herx reactions, because it is a whole other ball game. If you use functional medicine, the tolerance levels are very different when people are sick with Lyme, because any anytime you bring a biofilm breakers, you can have a bad flare and stuff like that. So it's just really important to realize that things that we do in FDN, that when you apply that model onto a Lyme case, whoa, you got to take a massive step back. Right. Massive step right. back, right? Great. Yeah. Well, good stuff. Rika, thanks for being on. Really enjoyed talking with you and sharing with everything you've – I think this is one we need to go back and listen to a couple of times to pull all the little nuggets and, and uh, uh, tips and things that you've kind of just woven in with your conversation just naturally. So, again, thanks for being part of the family and uh, talking with everybody. And uh, like I said, when the book comes out, let us know. We'll uh, let everybody know about it, and it's uh, a great okay. resource. Well, thank you to all, all right. and don't hesitate to ask. Yeah. All right. Thank great. you. Great. All the best. Thanks, Rika. Bye-bye. Be safe. Bye, everyone. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye.